Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions or comments at any time during today's presentation by using the chat pod located to the right of the slideshow presentation. Directly above the chat pod, you'll also notice a resources pod where you may download a copy of today's presentation. Please also note that we'll be playing a video during the presentation, so please make sure your speakers are turned on and unmuted so you may hear the audio to accompany the video. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Ms. Jenny C2. Hi, everyone. I am Jenny C2 from the American Hospital Association. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar titled Creating the Human Trafficking Victim Medical Home in Resident Physician Education, a Synergistic Dynamic of Care. This is brought to you by the AHA's Hospital, uh, Hospitals Against Violence Initiative. In 2016, the AHA implemented the Hospitals Against Violence initiative to highlight the work hospitals and health systems are doing to combat violence in their communities and their workplaces through educational offerings, partnerships, and research. On June 8th, AHA will host a Have Hope Day of Awareness with members coming together to demonstrate their work towards ending violence in their communities and workplaces via photos, tweets, and other digital outreach efforts. Details will be forthcoming at aha.org slash violence. As this webinar demonstrates the strong relationship between physicians and hospitals, the need for them to work together closely together has never been more important. That's why AHA has launched the Physician Alliance, a place for physician and administrative leadership to transform healthcare together. This initiative provides resources and events in three key areas of leadership, well-being, and health improvement. Sign up for this exclusive opportunity for AHA members at aha.org slash physicians to start receiving resources, training opportunities uh, available only to Alliance members. To present today's session, we are pleased to have with us Dr. Ron Chambers, Medical Director of Human Trafficking Clinic at Dignity Health and Human Trafficking Response Physician Advisor. Dr. Chambers is passionate about human trafficking victim and survivor care and the creation of trauma-informed, victim-centered medical homes for survivors, coinciding with resident physician education and training. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dr. Chambers. Dr. Chambers, please begin. All right, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to begin this presentation by just mentioning that it's one of um, a series of three webinars that uh, Dignity Health and the AHA collaborated on to um, put this information out. And the first webinar was focused on HT awareness or human trafficking awareness, um, common red flags to look for prevalence in healthcare. And the second was focused on victim-centered trauma-informed care. Um, I hope if people miss those webinars, they get a chance to take a look at them and get some of that information. I'm going to overlap, overlap some of that information briefly um, in this presentation today, and I'm just going to try and bring up some of um, the pertinent data that I think is relevant to the translation from going uh, from an acute care hospital setting, identifying or recognizing, identifying and potentially intervening on the victim's behalf, uh, behalf to uh, being able to take care of them in a more longitudinal setting and meeting their needs there. So. Um, <clears throat> With that being said, um, I'll just a few words on the human trafficking medical safe haven or medical home that we created at our hospital within our residency clinic. Um, the way that this came to fruition was uh, I was fortunate to, to be involved in some of the early work that was happening around human trafficking with Dignity Health, although um, the program director, Holly Gibbs, um, she had done an expansive amount of work and created protocols. Um, we were fortunate to get the education from her and from the people in the um, committees at Dignity Health and, and be able to implement those at our hospitals. What we found pretty early on, though, was that would, if we had a victim that was identified, um, 
the need the needs the medical needs of that victim um, were ongoing and this was something that we were looking to address by creating these medical safe havens and the concept I think has grown and morphed and um, turned into a pretty successful model of meeting the needs of these patients um, and for perspective I believe in the last year um, our medical Safe Haven provided, um, again, longitudinal care for victims. About 125 new victims were in our clinic, and that probably encompassed about 4 to 500 patient visits. Um, so that's just a little background. So uh, the learning objectives, I think a lot of these, again, were covered in previous uh, presentations. I'm not going to go through those. I do just want to, again, briefly touch on the prevalence, and this is basically um, in case people missed the first two webinars. I think that this information can be helpful. Um, when we look at where many of the victims, at least coming to our clinic today, um, where does this originate? I, I'd like to go back to some of the early data. Um, the Justice Department's National Incidence Study um, indicated that 1.7 million children run away each year, and out of that, 357,000 get reported, and that's 21 percent, um, meaning 79 percent do not get reported. And I think that's a pretty telling statistic when, when, when you recognize right off the bat that of the children that run away in this country this year, there's going to be a very large percentage of them that are coming from home environments, living situations where their loved one, their caregiver, whoever was supposed to be taking care of them, um, didn't bother reporting to the police. I, I think that's telling. Then you combine that with other statistics, like one in six runaways reported missing in 2015 was um, likely a victim of sex trafficking in the United States. Over 300,000 youth are at risk of being sexually exploited for commercial use in the U.S. Um, victims often being reported as young as 13, some younger. Now, these numbers, when they get thrown around, very often um, get criticized. People say that they're being, uh, the, the topic's being sensationalized, we're trying to draw attention to it, um, what is the data, it's faulty data. And I think it's really important that we recognize the fact that this is an illegal problem. It's in the underground nature in of itself um, prohibits good data collection. And so, the interesting thing I always find when we argue these numbers is when new studies come out, I don't know if I've ever seen one where the numbers go down. They traditionally always go up. Um, so if we look at our clinic and um, the patients we're seeing there, I can give you some background on the types of patients we're seeing um, and, and where their uh, histories of traffic often originate. Um, many of them come from familial backgrounds, so family members of the traffickers. Um, Often, if that's the case, um, a very young age of onset um, is reported. I've, I've heard many, many, many of our victims and survivors uh, report they started being sold for sex at age five. Um, most of the recruitment is typically done by women. Um, the buyers, who are often referred to as johns or tricks, come from various backgrounds. And again, I know this was already covered. Um, obviously, um, many people are involved in trafficking, and the buyers are often described as middle-class married males with families, so they have the means, and that includes people like doctors, lawyers, law enforcement, and clergy. Um, so I think that all of that information is kind of important to, again, put into our heads as we think about how are we going to be able to take care of this patient population. Um, the, the number 100,000 just gets thrown around um, all over the place, I feel like, when I, when I talk to people about trafficking, and that number originated from Ernie Allen, who is the former president and CEO of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And um, he presented that in congressional testimony in 2010. Uh, the hard thing was the data behind that number wasn't quite there, and so it was later recounted. recanted. But I would argue that, if anything, when we're looking at that number, um, we need to put into perspective. I am of the opinion that we are taking a number that was given by the person at the time that probably had their pulse on um, the sexual exploitation of children in the United States, as good as anyone. Um, and he came up with 100,000. But even if he was wrong, even if he was off by a factor of two, and it was only 50,000 um, children being sold for sex in the United States at that time, that would mean that a teenage female in this country this year would be 20 times as likely to be trafficked as to die in an automobile accident and 50 times as likely to be trafficked as to commit suicide. Now, the reason why this is important to me as a healthcare provider is because during the HEADS assessment, which we are all taught to do with our adolescent patients in both medical school and in residency, 
um, we're required to document um, suicide prevention. We're required to document um, discussions we have about automobile safety. And there's nothing that was ever taught to me in my medical school training or residency about human trafficking. And here it is a problem incredibly more likely to be affecting my patients. Um, and of course, he said the only way not to find this in American city is simply not to look for it. So I would encourage you, no matter where you're at right now, um, <clears throat> become aware. I, I think it's very simple. There's lots of websites that people can go to. There's Eurostat.co, there's New Red Book, there's Backpage.com is one that's gotten a lot of notoriety in the press recently. Um, and if you go to it, you can scroll to whatever city you're in right now. This is a screenshot of Sacramento. And um, you scroll to your, your state, then to your city, then you click on Women for Men or Men for Women, and you're going to get this Craigslist like you. Um, that goes on for hundreds of listings. Now, these hundreds of listings that we see as we scroll down here in Sacramento um, are going to, if you click on any one of them, show you um, a description and pictures of typically a young woman, sometimes a young man, um, that is being sold for sex. Um, the vast majority of patients that I've um, taken care of in, in our clinic that were involved in sex trafficking were sold on these websites. If you go back to the website backpage.com and, and click on it an hour from now, you're going to see that you have tens or hundreds of new listings. So when we talk about the prevalency in our, in our society and where it's at and all around us, I think that one of the, the biggest problems that I've run into um, doing this work is that I feel like it's rare these days that I can go almost anywhere and not see a trafficking victim. Um, you know, it can be a, in line at 7-Eleven or just driving down the street. And knowing the tattoos to look for, the interaction, the way people are behaving with one another, trafficking is happening all around us every day. And I, I would encourage you to look into it, how incredibly prevalent it is in our society. Um, again, these are just some perhaps inflammatory indicators, but I, again, I do think they speak to societal acceptance. If you go on Amazon.com, you can look at um, books like Pimpology or The Pimp Game. My Pimpology here has 169 reviews with four stars. If you read on this in, in this book, um, you can look at Pimp's Business Goal Number One, Obtaining the Product, A Bitch's Weakness is a Pimp's Weakness. The weakness is the best trait a person can find in someone they want to control. If you can't find a weakness, you have to create one. You have to tear someone's ego down to nothing before they'll start looking to you for salvation. Then you have a chance to build them back up, showing them that it's your program that takes them from darkness to hope. While you want them to feel good about themselves eventually, you want them to feel that it's because of you. They begin to see you as the champion, their hero, even if the weakness you rescue them from is the one you created. Here's goal number three, selling the product. You'll start to dress her, think for her, own her. If you and your victim are sexually active, slow it down. After sex, take her shopping for one item. Hair and or nails is fine. To develop a feeling of accomplishment, the shopping after a month will replace with cash, the love that can turn into raw sex. She'll start to crave the intimacy and be willing to get back into your good graces. After you have broken her spirit and she has no sense of self-value, now Pam put a price tag on the item you have manufactured. So this is sick stuff, but I think, again, what it talks about is it's interesting that we can go onto Amazon and on Amazon Prime, I can I can buy a book that's going to tell me essentially how to trauma bond somebody. When we talk about trauma bonding and working with this patient population, I think it's an incredibly important concept because I think it provides a, a perspective and the level of empathy that we might otherwise miss with these patients. So trauma bonding, it's a term developed by Patrick Klein to develop the misuse of fear, excitement, sexual feelings, and sexual physiology to entangle another person. Traumatic bonding occurs as the result of ongoing cycles of abuse in which the intermittent reinforcement of reward and punishment creates powerful emotional bonds resistant to change. Um, I often see with our patients that the intensity is mistaken for intimacy or it's, it's um, convoluted. It's the, the emotional bonds that happen with this are intense and, and they truly are like a physical chain. Um, the the typical scenario or story that I will hear from one of our patients um, would go something along these lines. It would be um, a history in the household very often of, of abuse or neglect. Um, very often they're going to be one of that 79% of children that run away from 
um, their homes that don't get reported, and they hit the streets. And you've got a 12 or 13 year old on the street, and uh, the traffickers know exactly where to pick them up. Um, here in Sacramento, the child receiving unit, um, the traffickers wait right outside of it. They used to hang out in IHOP and Denny's across the street. Now apparently they hang out just on the street and they pick up kids when they sign themselves out. But the trafficker then will take this young individual very often and, you know, wine and dine for a while. And then my patient will say, at some point the, the temper trafficker got mad and, and beat me up and, you know, beat me to a bloody pulp. And it's the middle of winter here in Sacramento and he drove me down and um, he stripped me naked and dumped me out on the railroad tracks behind the warehouse on Auburn Boulevard. And then he peed on me and he got in his car and drove off. And hours went by. You know, and then, of course, law enforcement doesn't know they're out there. FBI doesn't swoop in. Um, we in the healthcare field don't know about it, don't do anything. But, of course, who comes back? It's, it's going to be the trafficker. And he picks up this very often young woman and, takes her home and gives her a warm bath and buys her a new dress and takes her shopping. And, and if you think about the psychology behind that, this happening to a 13, 14, 15, even 18, 19, 20, 25 year old, doesn't happen once or twice, it happens over and over and over again. And this is happening to an individual during the developmental years when they're developing executive function, front lobe, frontal lobe development. The psychology behind that, that trauma bonding, truly does tie this person to their trafficker. And it, it's an interesting thing to hear about, to witness, and to try and wrap our heads around. I, I um, spent a long time in, in clinic yesterday discussing these feelings the patient was, happening, was having. She was new to me, um, just got out of a trafficking situation. And she, she was describing um, the horrific things her trafficker had done to her, while at the same time having this complex um, insight with herself about why was she feeling like she needed to go back to this person. She was feeling drawn back and wanting to go back. So that trauma bonding is real, and it's, a, it's a, an important aspect of this patient's story that we need to be able to address. Um, when we argue the numbers, though, and we're talking about prevalence in our society and we're talking about trauma bonding, I, I also am of the opinion, I'm, I'm not sure that we need to be arguing numbers. It's a single person, a single scenario where this happens is just too many. Um, it really just takes one person uh, for, for us, I think, to be able to rationalize that it's important for us to become educated on this topic and to do what we can to stop it. Um, you know, uh, here's a patient I think I saw last week, 18-year-old um, pregnant female with history of bipolar disorder, substance abuse, recent suicide attempt, apparent developmental delay, um, removed from commercial sex trafficking yesterday, started at age five and encouraged by her HIV-positive mother, who is also her current guardian, a patient's two-year-old child, brought in uh, by a community organization um, with complaints of anxiety, insomnia, nightmares, um, she has multiple cuts and bruises over her body. She describes vaginal discharge, a cough, and hearing loss. So this is a complex patient. Um, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot to this encounter. Uh, I've, I've had a, people ask um, when we've been giving presentations in the past, you know, how did you get involved in this, or what, why do you want to do this work? And uh, I've given it some thought, and I, I think that the, the answer truly is you just need to see one patient that's been a human trafficking victim. And you realize the importance. That the answer, the question then changes from like, why do you want to do this work to how can you not do something about this, about what's happening? Um, so why is this important for healthcare? Again, it's access. And, and I know that this was covered, uh, but we in healthcare are one of the few people in society that are actually going to have the opportunity to see many uh, trafficking victims while they're being trafficked. So there was a study done um, where they showed 88% of victims that were interviewed who identified as female sex trafficking survivors, and they reported that they had contact with the healthcare system without any intervention being done. There was another study out of Oakland, California, where 77% of sexually exploited youth reported seeing a physician regularly. 33% um, or a third were on prescribed meds and half had been hospitalized. 
So where are we seeing these victims? We're seeing them in our emergency rooms, Planned Parenthood centers, family physicians offices, um, urgent care clinics, women's clinics, neighborhood clinics. And how prepared are we as physicians? Well, I alluded to this earlier, but um, these are two questions that I sent out to the family medicine residency programs. Um, there's a family medicine residency program listserv. It's an email listserv. There's 537 family medicine programs in the country. And prior to trying to give a presentation at one of our conferences, I sent out two questions um, just to gather information for the presentation. And out of the 537 programs, um, I got a response from 62. Um, so a very poor response rate. 62 out of the 537, you know, cared enough to respond to the questions about the subject. And, and two questions. Do residents at your program, resident physicians, see human trafficking victims within the clinical settings they work? Now, 42% said yes, they probably do. Um, I would argue right off the bat that they're wrong, that um, the people that said no, um, their residents are seeing trafficking victims. Um, and then the second question I asked is, is your residency program currently providing structured education or training for residents on human trafficking? And out of that 62 or 3, 14% um, said yes. So if you kind of do the numbers out of 537 programs, that would give you about maybe eight, nine programs in this country training our physicians um, are actually giving any education on this. So obviously that needs to change. Now in the previous topics, you've already looked at um, signs and symptoms, so I'm going to kind of blow past these. Um, I think some of the um, important ones, though, that um, people may not immediately think about is somebody that's really avoiding eye contact that's very prevalent in many of our patients or bruised scars and hidden spaces. Um, <clears throat> knowing the tattoos in your community, knowing the pimps, the traffickers, um, has been very helpful for us. We've been able to create books of um, the pimps or traffickers' names because many of our victims were branded by the traffickers as a sign of ownership. And using those names to identify victims in the emergency department labor and, traf or labor and delivery centers um, has, has been helpful. Um, our residents, my residents, have actually identified patients as human trafficking victims that were intubated in the ICU that were unconscious and couldn't talk because they recognized the tattoos. Um, I would also argue that one of the most important aspects that maybe people don't immediately go to um, that is a huge, huge indicator is going to be the level of PTSD, anxiety, depression, and stress that we see in this patient population. Um, having an awareness and working with these patients is difficult. And, and this is just, a, again, a concept that I, I bring up because if we're going to be able to provide longitudinal care for these patients, I think that we need to address the needs of the, the physicians, the providers, the different people um, involved in this patient care because there is frustrations and there is vicarious trauma. And we've talked about interacting with um, a potential human trafficking victim in the previous webinars on um, using a victim-centered trauma-informed approach and recognizing that that when we're interviewing a patient, there's a high likelihood that they're highly traumatized, and it's going to take time to get a sense of safety um, established. And using people like hospital social workers or sane or safe nurses, sexual assault nurse examiners or forensic examiners can be very helpful. But I will also tell you that it can be very difficult because many, many of the victims that we see um, refuse these services, refuse law enforcement, refuse um, having um, a forensic examination. And kind of a, an example scenario I would use is um, we had a patient that we were working very closely with over the course of a couple of years, and um, she had really moved from um, a trafficking victim into a survivor role, and she was, she was doing incredibly well. She was working in a trade um, school, and she was actually finishing up her education in the trade trade school, she um, was very excited about her future and she was walking down the street and her trafficker saw her walking down the street and grabbed her, um, threw her in the back of a van and drove her over to Oakland. Um, he beat her up pretty bad and then he sold her over in Oakland for a number of months um, before she escaped and, and came got back here to Sacramento. When she got back to Sacramento, she immediately went to one of the community organizations she was working with 
and they immediately brought her to our clinic and um, she was she was beat up cut up um, she was dehydrated she she looked a mess and so I direct admitted her to the hospital during that direct admission I found out that she was pregnant um, she said that it was the trafficker's baby that um, the the tricks or Johns were made to use protection but the trafficker was trying to get her pregnant and was raping her so she was pretty sure it was his baby we had all the physical signs we could possibly want with the cuts and bruises all over her body and we likely had the DNA evidence um, you know she was pregnant with the trafficker's, trafficker's baby presumably so to me this was a slam dunk let's get police involved let's get this guy put away and um, she said absolutely not there's no way that that I'll testify against him um, one of the things he did with her is he walked her around to her her mother and her little brother and pointed them out with with his friends to her and said if, if I go to jail if you ever talk these are the people that we come back and we kill and you know the um, associate district attorney here in Sacramento who, who I work with very closely will be the first to tell you that that's not an idle threat that does happen so there's a lot of reasons, a lot of coercion, a lot of things that that make this a, a difficult thing for for the victims and make it a difficult thing as, as medical providers when we really want to be able to do something um, to end a situation, but for very justified reasons that may or may not be able to happen. Um, so having perspective with trauma-informed care is incredibly important, and again, this this trauma is very often it's going to be complex and chronic and I think about PTSD um, and the patients that I see that get up from a car accident and it's real and it can be incredibly impactful on their life and disabling in fact and and I'm not discounting that at all but it is a point in time um, many of the patients that we see that come from human trafficking backgrounds really do have this chronic complex trauma that's going to be um, affecting symptomatology over a lifetime. We could be talking about somebody that was raped 3,000 times a year over the course of a decade. And that's going to that's gonna be deep, dark trauma, and that's not going to go away quickly. Obviously, when we identify these victims and we potentially intervene on their behalf using a victim-centered approach, um, we get them out of these situations, hopefully, and get them into safe houses and, and working with community agencies and giving them a um, network in where they're going to be receiving trauma therapy and in the various modalities that they need but really from a medical standpoint we need to continue our care as well um, the hospitals need to translate this this identification into the continuity of care that I think creating medical safe havens really allows um, I know that just again from a physician perspective one of the most common questions I get during these conversations is well what about mandated reporting and how does that play out and I think it's very important that when we are in the emergency room and we think we're, we're dealing with a human trafficking victim, we do use a victim-centered care approach because the last thing I want to do is try to have a conversation with, with the trafficking victim and, and discuss that this is a safe place. We're going to do things, you know, on your behalf and then say, oh, but we have to call police because we're mandated reporters and they didn't want police involved because now it's not a safe place. So setting this up, having these conversations um, in a way that's victim-centered is incredibly important. Um, typically, we've had this scenario happen a number of times where we've been called in and they think that um, somebody's identified potentially a human trafficking victim. And so very often, what, what, the way that I approach it, at least with adults, is um, I, I stop them and say that, you know, you're, the, the description you're giving me right now is something that's making me concerned about something called human trafficking. Do you know what that is? Because a lot of patients don't know what human trafficking is. And then we discuss human trafficking. And then I also explain what being a mandated reporter is. You can, you can talk to me about what's happened but if you tell me that story and show me a cut or bruise now i'm going to have to report it because i want i want to make sure that they're in control of if and when we have an intervention now those laws are going to vary state to state but um in california that's an approach that we use and um it again it allows the victim to take control of their medical care and whether or not an intervention is going to happen so we have a lot of different questions we can ask and i know these have already been covered we've already 
um, discuss some of the screening, screening tools that are being developed. It seems like more and more people are coming up with screening tools and they're coming out and I think they're, they're very helpful. Um, when we respond, <clears throat> the, the response needs to have certain characteristics. And I think the real key, if, I don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back one slide is that when we think about having a response, we have to have protocols and they have to be developed ahead of time. My concern when we give these discussions and, and when we, or when I give talks to medical groups is that they say, wow, this is very important. We want to get involved with it. But then at the same time, they don't have a protocol developed ahead of time. So if they're interviewing a patient and they're worried about their, their trafficking victim, you know, I think we can all fall into that last point, the rescue fantasy and say, Oh my gosh, this is horrible. What's happening to you? We're going to get you out of this. We're going to, you know, we're going to take care of this. We're going to make you safe because unless you have a protocol in place, can you really, you know, that the trafficker could be in the waiting room with a gun or what if there's no beds available at the safe houses in your area? So all of the little, all of the details of how you're going to intervene on a patient's behalf really need to be worked out and they need to be problem solved and they need to be vetted. Now, it's exciting that Dignity Health really put together, I think, a very robust program that um, uses protocols to do this in a way that is safe for the patients and the providers. And again, this was, the, the charge was led and the protocols were written by Holly Gibbs, who's our program director in this. And, and um, it has been an enormously successful um, project that I, I think that really needs to be spread. I mean, in my opinion, putting these protocols out, I, I wish that Joint Commission would make it a requirement for hospitals to implement these because then instead of trying to convince hospitals that this is a worthwhile topic and they need to address this, they would be asking for the protocols because it would be a Joint Commission requirement. Now, that's just my opinion. Um, people may disagree. But the key points are, again, you've got to get the patient alone, have a way to do that, have a problem solved. You have to have it be safe both for the patient and the provider now and then the days to come. Um, you need to inform the patient about mandated reporting laws, confidentiality, ask if they want intervention, so victim-centered approach, and so we've talked about this. And this is just some screenshots of the um, protocols that are available. If you were to Google Dignity Health and Human Trafficking, it would take you to a web page where um, there is a shared learnings manual that is freely downloadable, and these um, protocols can be downloaded um, and modified for your institution. Um, uh, creating them, obviously, we had to deal with all types of um, uh, different parts of the process, people that are going to be um, dealing with, with the trafficking victims and survivors, law enforcement, CTS, hospital, um, the different departments within the hospital. We needed to know who the community service providers were and what services they had to offer. If they were more involved with safe houses, were they more involved with trauma therapy or case management services? So those were all important pieces that we we needed to know about as we took on this patient population and this problem. Luckily here in Sacramento we have a number of just amazing, amazing organizations that um, do incredible work um, dollar for dollar. I, I don't know how they do it, but it's, um, it's been a wonderful thing to be able to collaborate with them. Um, there are the national resources like the, um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline, and I know this was already brought up in the in the previous protocols. At this point, I do want to show a brief video as, as we really get into um, the, the main point of my, um, my presentation now is, is creating longitudinal medical safe havens for victims of human trafficking. And I think incorporating it into residency clinic settings is the most important thing. So here's a video. <clears throat> I remember I would look in the mirror and in hotel rooms just staring at myself like, who are you? And it just felt like I was nothing. I grew up mostly in a dysfunctional home. No consistency or stability. Drugs and alcohol were very common and were really the norm for me in my household. I didn't recognize that there was people in the world that didn't have my best interests at heart. 
Without realizing it, at the age of 17, I was being groomed for the life. I didn't want to do it. My trafficker knew where my mother lived, and that's where my daughter was. And he would say, if you leave, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to kill your family. Being trafficked was like a scary dream that I could not wake up from. I knew I needed to get out, but I didn't know how. Eighty-eight percent of trafficking survivors reported they had an encounter with a health care provider while they were being trafficked, with zero percent of them being identified. And so being able to recognize them is incredibly important because that's how we can help get them out of their trafficking situation. The Human Trafficking Response Program that Dignity Health has set up, all of the staff throughout the hospital system, everybody from the janitor through our front desk staff, every medical assistant, our nurses, all of our physicians have been trained in victim-centered trauma-informed care and they've gone through extensive human trafficking training. In retrospect now, because of the training, I realized some of the patients that I may have encountered, um, that I may have been frustrated by, were probably victims of human trafficking. And that's why the training is so important, right? Because it shatters these preconceived notions and these ideas and these misconceptions that you have, um, either as a healthcare provider or someone in the community. It's happened with every provider here, where it gives you pause and you think, gosh, I wonder if the reason that patient was so abrasive or uncooperative or unable to give a history was because of the trauma they had undergone. The trauma that they've been through has been so severe for so long, they're going to need time to recover. And so we're able to help get them resources and access to care. When I first started to realize that I had PTSD, things were happening when I didn't want to even be touched have these moments where I would just literally cry uncontrollably and I didn't understand like why this was happening to me. With trauma your body keeps the score. I knew I needed to seek professional help. I've been seeing Dr. Chambers for three or four months and he's really kind and compassionate and didn't make me feel uncomfortable. I feel like it's really important for medical professionals to be trained while working with trafficking victims and survivors because it allows people like me and so many others to feel comfortable to receive the help. It's also helped me become stronger and face myself. My life today is unbelievable. I have a great family, a great husband, daughter is amazing. I'm living my dream. The Human Trafficking Response Program has made me a better doctor. Every patient I've seen has been affected by my training. It's really taught me an incredible amount of patience and listening and really see them for who they are and what their story is. And I think that can't lead to anything but better treatment. So um, just just to comment on that video, I <clears throat> I that patient that was one of the um, patients at our clinic. Obviously, a, a survivor doing very well, but she um, she felt so strongly um, that being able to come to a clinic where um, the staff, where everybody from the schedulers to the medical assistant, nursing staff, janitor on up, everybody has been trained in human trafficking, victim center trauma, and informed care. She felt like that was so important in her recovery um, that she basically wrote a grant to get that video made. And it was kind of an interesting thing. Initially, I think many of us were very hesitant and almost against and didn't want to participate. We're kind of like, why are we making a video? But that video has actually turned out to be a very, very useful tool. Um, what many of the caseworkers that bring patients into us do now is um, on the way in, riding in the car, they'll have this 
um, new patient that's never been to our clinic watch the video, and, and it's amazing how much ice it breaks. Uh, by the time the patient arrives, they, they know that we understand about human trafficking, that we're here to provide um, a resource for them to, to help them with their needs. And so I've, I've actually really appreciated and um, in retrospect was, um, <laughs> it was much in the wrong in my reluctance to make that video because um, it, it really has been useful. Um, as we went into this though, and we were looking at creating um, a medical safe haven for human trafficking victims, it was an interesting thing because there were so many gaps in, in what we knew to do or not to do. Um, the, there isn't anywhere in the vast majority of medical textbooks where they mention human trafficking, even a sentence. Um, and so there's not routine labs that I know to order. There's not medications that I know to use. There's not ways that we have been taught how, to, how do we approach, how do we interact with these victims. And so part of this was kind of creating that wheel. And, um, and I'm just going to run through what we came up with. Now, there are organizations throughout the country that have been doing this. Um, but I am going to just try and make three main points um, when I talk about creating that longitudinal medical safe haven for for, um, for victims and survivors of human trafficking. The first one is that if you put it into resident physician education, it is low utilization. Um, it's a very small increase in the resources for us to be able to adopt this patient population into our clinic and to provide the care that I believe they need. Um, so first point is it's cheap. The second point is it has the potential to provide widespread care. There's 537 family medicine residency programs in this country alone. All of them are going to have a clinic associated with them. The vast majority of those clinics are already built to treat underserved patient populations. So again, it's cheap. We have the ability to provide widespread care. And third, and perhaps most importantly, it also trains the physicians of tomorrow to be able to take care of this vulnerable patient population. When I give talks to, to physician groups that where the doctors have been in practice 20 or 30 years, you know, they might think it's interesting, but then they go back to work the next day and, and maybe they adopt some of what we said or maybe they don't. But hitting a, hitting a physician during their residency education, they are absolutely malleable. This is the time in their, their career where they're learning how they're going to practice medicine for the next 30 years. If we can teach them, have the education and training incorporated into their, their program, we're going to create a, a nation of physicians that know how to deal with this patient population. And I really think that's key because it is experiential learning. It's not just getting a didactic on it. It's getting the education and then actually seeing these patients. And that was, that's a real paradigm shift I see every time with the residents. The first time they see a trafficking victim, the first the first time they come out of the room and you can see that shift that's happened on their, their face, the way that they're going to approach this patient care just became real. So that it's a, I think it's got some real validity as far as it being a viable construct for care for, for this patient population. So let's just run through it real quick. This is a screenshot from um, our website. And um, our website address is www.dignityhealth.org backslash Sacramento, backslash human trafficking. And on our website, we talk about um, the services we provide. We have a lot of feedback from the organizations that bring us clients. We have some videos for the patients to watch. Um, I want to talk about putting this education and training again into the residency education. If you look back um, in our clinic alone, in the positions that I work with alone, in the past, we never once identified human trafficking victims. You know, 88% in that study that we mentioned early um, see a medical provider while they're being trafficked without any being identified. And many obviously talk to me about seeing medical providers and being re-traumatized through their experiences. Our present day is that we absolutely identify victims. My residents identify victims, again, in labor and delivery, in the emergency room, in the clinic, um, the one in the ICU that was intubated. And what's interesting to me is many of the victims that we see in our clinic today, <clears throat> I can go back in their charts and I can see that we saw them in the past. And what the, one that comes to mind is um, a young woman we were seeing a few weeks back, and she's 18 years old. Um, she was being trafficked the day before she was brought into our clinic, so she's just out of a trafficking situation. And she came in with her four-year-old child. 
After seeing her, I went back and looked in her medical record, and four years ago when I looked back, who delivered that baby? We did. And um, we had a 14-year-old mom. She was marijuana positive. Um, so we got social work involved. We got we thought we asked all the right questions. We got everybody involved. We discharged her home. We thought we put a bow on it. A month later, we readmitted that baby for an acute life-threatening event. And again, 14-year-old mom, marijuana positive. We got everybody involved. We thought we asked all the right questions. We discharged her home. We missed the fact that she was being trafficked at that time. And absolutely, the red flags were there, the warning signs, and we would not have missed that patient today. So I would say that the education and training absolutely works. When I was just doing a training in San Francisco a few weeks back, they had never identified, the residents had never identified a trafficking victim, and within five days, they identified two. So, so this training works, it just needs to get to the decisions. But then when we create the longitudinal wheel, we have to know how to do it. And, and again, this is a work in process. I don't know if anybody knows how to do it perfectly. We haven't been doing it that long. But I think that by putting it into family medicine physicians' offices and actually residency clinics, and I think we can extend that to other primary care fields, pediatrics, OBGYN, internal medicine, we have the chance to be able to provide this widespread care and, and train the doctors of tomorrow. For us in our clinic, being in family medicine, it really is a one-stop shop for the patient. So I can see a patient. Um, she can be bringing in her child. We can see the child at the same time. We can treat the STD, initiate contraception. We can treat a rash. We can treat um, the PTSD. We can get the immunizations caught up. We can. We can do all of this, and if you know patients that are pregnant, we can take them through their prenatal care. We can deliver their babies. We can um, work in and outside the hospital taking care of this patient population. So it really does work. When we were doing this, however, again, we didn't we didn't have textbooks to refer to. So we, we did write book chapters on this. We've come up with a a list of lab work that I think is pretty applicable to most trafficking patients that we come in, and it includes a lot of stuff people would intuitively think about. Um, you know, basic metabolic panels and STDs, but I think it also includes things that people may or may not think about, like checking quantiferon gold for tuberculosis because of the exposure risk, checking immunization titers because many of these patients come from backgrounds where they never got the vaccination. So all of that's key. We also, um, we also created ways that we interact with the patients while we're in the room. Um, and um, this has just been through experience and trial and error over, you know, like 125 patients in this last year. Things that have worked, things that we feel like are very um, conducive to opening up the conversation and creating a therapeutic relationship with this patient. Um, so these points are more things that I've created for my residents because my residents are running around the hospital and they're taking care of literally hundreds of patients that are coding and crashing and they're intubating and they're doing lumbar punctures and they're delivering babies and they're doing these amazing things and then they go in to see their first human trafficking victim and they're intimidated, they're scared, they don't know what to do. So we wrote through how we came up with um, this encounter, how, how we can lay it out. Um, we're trying to work on some things like the secondary or vicarious trauma. It's real. I, I don't have a good solution to that yet. We use debriefing. Um, so anyways, all of this information is, is brought up and taught to the resident. And we've also come up with a lot of medications that we use. I think far and away the most important thing I do when I see a victim that's coming in that was being trafficked yesterday, I think about the analogy that he or her, her or his life has up to that point been very intense. There's been a lot of trauma and it's kind of like pedal to the metal, foot on the gas. When you get that patient out, and they get into a safe house, and that night they're going to hear crickets, and that is so unfamiliar that they bolt. And that's the scenario that we hear over and over again. It's that so many patients that end up in safe houses leave. They run back to their traffickers, and the statistics are all over the place. I've heard that the average teenage victim may run back to the trafficker up to seven times. Um, I'm sure that hasn't been well validated, but but I've seen it in practice that this is a common scenario that can happen. But if we can use a little bit of a mood stabilizer, a little bit of Seroquel, a little bit of Zyprexa that's a little sedating, can stabilize the mood, can take away some of that fight or flight response, maybe add in some Prazosin to take away their nightmares that night, 
Now that patient's got a night in the safe house. Now they've got two or three nights a week and then a month. And now they're receiving all the wraparound services that are really going to do the real work, the trauma therapy, the parenting classes, the case management services. The community organizations we work with do 99.9999% of the work, in my opinion. The little sliver we do from the medical piece, though, that what I'm told consistently from the community organizations is that sliver allows the rest of that to happen because they're able to hold on to these, these victims and really get them on a the road to recovery. And that's what they tell say again and again is this has changed the game for us. This has allowed us to hold on to our victims, make them survivors. So yeah, I, I, I just feel very passionate. This really, this concept needs to spread. Um, we did come up with, um, again, banks of labs that we order, um, how we approach the patients. The interventions or the feedback we get from the organizations is this intervention saved her life. That's the bottom line. My resident physicians, um, I'll just say this, this last paragraph, to say that I've benefited from this training is an understatement. It's a privilege. It's humbling. It makes me a better family doctor. So the next steps I really think we need to do is, is start putting this into residency education across the country. Um, we've written some papers, book chapters, presentations. Um, I have a study going right now where we've trained eight uh, residency programs um, up and down California in family medicine, internal medicine. I traveled to the programs and put the residents through this education and training that we put our residents through and then evaluated before and after their um, knowledge, attitude, and skills. And, you know, bottom line is, yeah, they got smarter when it comes to dealing with human trafficking. Their attitude, they, they felt like they could understand trauma-informed care, apply it to the, the patient population. Their attitude, taking care of trafficking victims, got dramatically better. Um, their skill set, knowing where to find resources, understanding, understanding the indicators of signs, um, applying victim-centered care. Um, again, it got better. And this isn't rocket science stuff. Obviously, that's going to happen after somebody gets some training. But it didn't take that much. And if we could, again, incorporate this human trafficking victim and survivor care into family medicine and residency clinics across the country, it would cost very little. It's, it's been a very small increase in utilization for us to adopt this patient population. Plus, we're a residency clinic, so we're already used to taking care of vulnerable patient populations. So it's low cost. We could provide widespread care, and we would train the doctors of tomorrow to do it. Um, there's my three bullet points. You get the ripple effect from training the physician. Um, we did go so far as to create um, an instruction guide on how to create these medical safe havens, and we're using it over the next 18 months to two years to try and replicate the medical safe haven that we have within our residency clinic at those eight programs up and down California within the Dignity Health System. And so if we can replicate this model, show that it's working at these various residency programs, show that residents do get better in their skills, knowledge, and attitude assessments. I think that we have a pretty strong argument to the powers that be. I don't know who they are. But to, be, to, to incorporate this care into family medicine, residency education, and training. Um, so that, that's kind of the ultimate goal I have. Um, and again, I think it's very applicable to other fields. I think it's applicable, applicable I'm sorry, to um, OBGYNs, to internal medicine to pediatrics, and I think that in systems where there's not um, one of those branches, you can always collaborate between various branches. Um, it has been a very, very successful model, and um, I think I'll end it there. Um, and I apologize, my voice has been out. I, I have laryngitis. I guess we made it through this, this presentation, but, but if it's been going in and out on you, I apologize. So thank you all for listening, and um, I'll open up for any questions anybody might have. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. I thought your voice sounded fine, so no, no worries on that. Um, we have a question in the chat box. Uh, why don't more hospitals acknowledge human trafficking as, as an issue affecting their patients? How can this change? I think that's a very good question, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, our misunderstanding of the issue in our society or just like our lack of understanding or awareness of its prevalence. Um, what I'm often, what, what I often run into when we give these presentations is if we can get people in the room 
and tell them about what's going on and tell them about the patients you're seeing and look at the, you know, websites like Backpage and they see that we can find a 13-year-old being sold for sex within, you know, a half mile of where we're sitting in the room. People's eyes open and they do want to do something about it. I do think that there is a, a financial commitment that hospitals would need to um, absorb to train their staff, you know, their emergency room, their labor and delivery, the staff throughout the hospital as well as their physicians. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that Dignity Health has, you know, in my opinion, done a really good job at is they, they decided this is an important issue, we're going to take this on and we're going to put the resources in, and, um, and we're going to put in the man arrows to, to try and deal with it within our hospital system. I do think that, you know, people have ideas like I'm, I like the idea of making it a joint commission or CMS requirement um, so hospitals um, did or were mandated to do it. And I don't mean that as a big stick. I think it would just really, um, what it would probably do is it would make, make people more generally aware in the medical field that it is an important issue and that they are seeing these patients and that, you know, that, that, that the 15-year-old um, in the emergency room that is a human trafficking victim is just as important as the 78-year-old next door having a, you know, an MI, so. Great. Uh, what advice do you have for physicians who get discouraged by patients who repeatedly go back to their traffickers? How do you boost resiliency? I think I think one of the things is is understanding the background that the patients came from. So if you have that the, the trauma informed perspective, I think it allows um, it it allows I won't say an understanding, but I think it allows a perspective that makes you realize this isn't something I need to get frustrated by. This is part of the illness. This is part of their story and what's happened to them. You know, it's kind of the same way that we we um, deal with many things. I think we need to have balance groups. I think we need to have debriefings, and we need to have ways to deal with vicarious trauma. But I, I will also say this. I, I don't know that I've come up with a great solution, and there's, we've altered our patient flow. There were times when we were doing four or six new patient intakes, and by the end of it, you know, in an afternoon, the resident would be crying, I'd be crying, we'd all be crying, and it was like, okay, we're not, we can't sustain this, so we got to, we've got it. So we limited it now to like one to two new intakes in a half day, and then a couple follow-up visits if the patient, if the resident is being tracked in victims or survivors. Um, but yeah, if somebody else, I'm sure people are working on it, and I, I don't have um, the solution to what I would call vicarious trauma and, and incorporated into that resiliency. All right. Another question, uh, what are the laws regarding mandated, mandated training for healthcare workers? You know, there was a recent article that was um, put out on the Hill Physician Listserv that actually um, delineated this by state, and I would encourage people to look that up because I, I probably shouldn't have even talked about it as much as I did in this presentation because it does vary by state. And so, um, but people can look up if you, I think if you Google the human trafficking mandated reporting laws by state, you would probably get the article. Um, but, but there are articles that, that go through depending on where you live in the country. Well, we have some really great comments uh, coming in with, from Gina. She said, thank you for your presentation. The FBI classifies human trafficking to be one of the top three criminal crimes in the world with drugs and arms. This is a global issue with global patients. Um, and she also says she interviewed a colleague who leads the child victim program with the FBI who stated some of the ideal steps that can be taken as uh, robust services for victims, law enforcement, enforcement of laws and legislative foundation. She concurs with you in that it would be good to see um, JC International and their input. And also yeah, there are some great comments, sorry, from, from Holly Gibbs as well, uh, steps that they take at Dignity Health, Health to help staff deal with frustrations when patients refuse assistance, they pay survivors to speak and share their stories. 
and you know, I, I think that one of the nice things too is that um, I, I think Dignity has, through various departments, Mercy Foundation, um, Dignity Foundation, they've, they've really helped develop and grow this program, and they are looking at lots of different aspects. I mean, we collaborate with with um, the lab to get us really discounted rates for the labs we need. We use um, small pockets of grant money to pay for medications when they're needed. Um, we, um, we've we trained even people that help uh, enroll our patients into Medicaid services, so we're able to write off the first visit or two, get them the lab work that they need, and then um, hopefully have them enrolled by Medi in Medi-Cal or Medicaid so that future visits are covered. But the, the system also has even looked into, they, they've been having work groups and collaborate to try and create job opportunities for uh, victims as they're going through this process. And, you know, they're on the road to recovery, opening up opportunities for them. So I, I like to think that it's really a holistic approach that's being taken by, by the hospital system. Well, great. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a fantastic and informative uh, webinar. Uh, we thank our speaker and we thank you all, uh, participants, for joining the uh, webinar today to learn and to listen. Um, with that, uh, this is the end of the call and we thank you so much for joining. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this afternoon's presentation. You may disconnect your phone lines, log off your webinars, and thank you for joining us today.